Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the UZAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Diabetes in Dogs and Cats with Dr. Elizabeth Appleman. This webinar is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to share it with a friend. We'll be taking questions via the chat box and we'll be sure to save some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Elizabeth Appleman earned her undergraduate degree from Stanford University and her veterinary degree from the University of Pennsylvania. She then completed a one-year internship at AMC, followed by a three-year residency in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Appleman has been a board-certified internist since 2008, and she rejoined AMC as a senior veterinarian in 2011. We're grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's event. Please welcome Dr. Elizabeth Appleman. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Michelle. I was very happy to give this lecture because this is becoming, I would say, as big of a problem in dogs and cats as it is in people. Okay, so first we'll start off with a little bit of physiology as to how the body should normally work. So normally you would eat a meal containing sugar, which nowadays is pretty much anything that you eat. Uh, the sugar is absorbed in the GI tract and enters the bloodstream. And then you need a hormone called insulin to allow that sugar to go from the bloodstream and into the organs. And insulin is produced in an organ called the pancreas. So without insulin, the sugar cannot get to where it needs to go. So the pancreas and insulin are very important features of diabetes. Uh, most organs in the body require sugar for energy, and the brain in particular can only use sugar for energy. So it's very important for brain function to have sufficient blood sugar. Some other organs can use fat, such as ketones for energy. We'll get into that a little bit later. Without proper insulin, whether the amount of insulin or how effective the insulin is, the glucose is going to build up into the bloodstream. And this is called hyperglycemia. And that is ultimately how we diagnose diabetes. So you can see in the schematic below, the little blue molecules are the glucose or the sugar. And when it's too low, that's hypoglycemia. And when it's too high, it's hyperglycemia. So the definition of diabetes mellitus, we extrapolate this from people. There's type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And when we talk about diabetes mellitus, we're talking about a deficiency of insulin. So in type 1, the pancreas is diseased. This is often diagnosed in younger people or younger animals. And it, pancreas is just not producing insulin. In type 2, which is much more common worldwide, the pancreas is able to produce insulin, but the body isn't able to use that properly. And that's a concept called insulin resistance, where essentially the body is resistant to the insulin that's present in the bloodstream. So we've taken this classification scheme from people and we've applied it to animals and dogs tend to develop type 1 diabetes, cats more commonly develop type 2 diabetes. So you should not get confused, there's another disease called diabetes insipidus. This is different from diabetes mellitus. Mellitus is a Greek word for sugar or sweet. And that's actually how they used to diagnose diabetes back before they had blood tests, is they would taste the urine, it would be sweet tasting. Versus diabetes insipidus, it's insipid or tasteless. The urine was very dilute. Diabetes insipidus is a problem with water conservation and is a completely separate organ from diabetes mellitus. You probably also heard of gestational diabetes. This is similar or sort of falls as a subcategory of type 2 diabetes. And that's where you have the insulin resistance. So the insulin is present, but it's not working properly from pregnancy-related hormones. So progesterone, lactogen, growth hormone, all of those are working against the insulin um, functioning properly. This is quite rare in dogs, and it's never been reported in cats. 
Um, probably, you know, most of the dogs in the USA are spayed, so we just don't see this situation very often, but that's less common in Europe. Um, there was a case series in 2008 where they had 13 dogs with gestational diabetes and a little less than half were permanently diabetic even after giving birth. And you can see a photo of a Nordic Spitz on the bottom right and that seems to be a breed that may be predisposed to gestational diabetes. So why do animals develop diabetes? Well, just like in people, there's probably a pretty big genetic component and you can see some listed breeds both for dogs and cats, which are more likely to develop diabetes. Samoyeds, Bichons, Dachshunds, Poodles, Maltese, and then some cats as well. Uh, Diabetic cats tend to be more commonly male, where diabetic dogs tend to be more commonly female. And for dogs in general, female dogs are more predisposed to any hormonal disorder, both diabetes and others. Obesity, similar to people, obesity is a major factor in developing diabetes, most commonly in cats because cats develop type 2 diabetes. And there's several very well-defined um, pathways for how obesity leads to insulin resistance and subsequent diabetes. Drugs are something else that can predispose to diabetes in animals, especially if they have an underlying genetic predisposition. So steroids like prednisone, cyclosporin, um, certain hormone disorders, dogs with Cushing's disease, um, another hormone disorder can develop diabetes. Um, if there's any surgery in the pancreas, that's pretty uncommon to happen in dogs and cats, but that could also lead to diabetes. And then one final thing I'll mention is that a high carb diet is not going to cause diabetes. It may exacerbate any underlying genetic tendencies, but dogs in particular don't need to be gluten or carb free. That's really just more of like a wellness fad that's taking over the pet population. So how do we diagnose diabetes? Um, well, the first thing you're gonna look at is the blood sugar or the glucose, and you can see some normal values written there. There's a fairly large range. Um, cats can have a higher blood sugar and still be considered normal, but just having a single glucose reading alone is insufficient for a diagnosis. And this is particularly true in cats. Cats are notorious for having a very high blood sugar when they're stressed. It's the way their stress hormones work. And for a cat coming, you know, getting into the carrier, taking a cab to the hospital, having a blood draw, all of that is extremely stressful, especially cats that live indoors and have a pretty peaceful life. And so, you know, I routinely see cats in the hospital with a blood sugar in the 200s, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're diabetic. Um, so we look at the blood sugar and then we do additional blood work as well. There's a particular blood test called fructosamine. And this is looking the, at the blood sugar bound to a protein in the blood. And it gives essentially an average blood sugar over about a two week time frame. And this is similar, <clears throat> excuse me, to the A1C that um, you probably know or have been tested for yourself. So we don't use the A1C simply because it's a little bit more of a volatile or unstable blood blood sample and you need to run it um, more immediately as a point of care test versus the fructosamine we can send to an outside lab. So no matter what type of clinic that you're um, attending can have this measured. And that's why we've um, gravitated to fructosamine over the hemoglobin A1C. So what are the symptoms of diabetes that you should be worried about for your pet? So one of the big ones is excessive urination and drinking. Um, if you fill the water bowl and it immediately becomes emptied, drinking from unusual spots, you know, it's pretty unusual for your cat to drink from the toilet. So that should be a bit of a red flag. Or if you have a dog, you take it outside and it immediately runs for some, you know, gross puddle in New York City. That is most likely not normal. Um, and then because they're drinking so much, they may be having urinary accidents. Cats will urinate outside the litter box when there is a problem kind of to alert you to it or because they don't have the time to make it into the litter box. There may just be leaking urine where there's so much urine being produced. If the animal isn't able to go out enough, like a dog, they may start leaking it. And it's not an incontinence issue. It's not a muscular problem. It's that they simply can't hold the urine in. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, another sign might be a ravenous appetite. So, you know, with the exception of maybe a Labrador or a young golden retriever that's going to scarf down their food. Um, if your pet previously had more of a normal appetite and then they're just insatiable, then that is a cause for alarm, especially if they're losing weight despite that. There's very few diseases that cause weight loss despite having a good appetite. And I like the phrase that's written on the bottom starvation in the midst of plenty, where you check their blood sugar, it's high, they should be getting adequate nutrition, they're eating a lot, but somehow it's just not making it into the organs and the cells to translate into normal body functions. <clears throat> Some more species-specific syndromes, there's a plantar grade stance that more commonly happens in cats, so it can happen in dogs. And you can see the schematic on the right where the cat is walking flat-footed, more like a person instead of up on its toes. Um, there's very little treatment, really nothing that can be done for that, just a matter of controlling the diabetes. And sometimes it reverses, sometimes it doesn't. Dogs, on the other hand, tend to develop cataracts, um, and that can happen extremely quickly. Within 24 hours, they can go from no cataract to a full cataract. Essentially, the sugar gets trapped in the lens in the eye that pulls in water, and so it causes this very white, um, kind of classic-looking cataract. And because there's so much fluid and abnormal substances in the lens, those dogs are predisposed to uveitis and glaucoma. There's nothing we can do to dissolve the cataract. It just has to be removed as you would for a person or any other type of cataract. So why do these symptoms happen in diabetic pets? Uh, for the excessive urination and drinking, if you think about, again, the normal um, physiology of the body, you have the glucose or the sugar in the bloodstream. It gets filtered to the kidneys, just as all the blood supply does. And some of that glucose goes from the bloodstream into the kidneys and into the urine. And then the kidney is supposed to reabsorb the glucose from the urine so it doesn't all get emptied out of the body. But once your glucose reaches a certain amount, it exceeds this kidney threshold where there's too much glucose to get reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And for cats, you see that the glucose, this happens when the blood sugar is above 280. In dogs, it's a little bit lower when the blood sugar is above 180. So now you have a lot of excess glucose or sugar into the in the urine, and that sugar pulls water with it. Wherever sugar goes, water tends to follow. So it pulls the normal water in the blood vessels into the urine, and this is called an osmotic diuresis. And because there's excess water in the urine, the urine becomes very dilute, the urine volume increases, and animals need to urinate more. Uh, the drinking is more of a secondary phenomenon where the patient is drinking to compensate for the water loss. And that's, that's almost always the case, no matter what the cause of the excessive urination, the drinking is usually a compensatory mechanism. So if you restrict the water, it really does not help. The it's still going to urinate excessively in large amounts, but now the pet is at risk of becoming dehydrated. So that's why we say never restrict waters, it's not safe. Uh, for the weight loss with the ravenous appetite, the animals are eating, they're absorbing the sugar, but it just sits in the bloodstream. It is not able to enter the cells without the insulin, which is sort of like the key um, in a door um, to open up the cells and allow the sugar to enter. So the dog or cat feels hungry because that sugar is not reaching its end goal of providing energy to organs. And eventually, if that continues, the body starts to break down fat in the form of ketones. And that can be a very serious complication of diabetes that I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, you probably heard of the concept of pre-diabetes. That's um, you know essentially before you have a full-blown diabetic state. Uh, we don't have the same specific criteria that they use in people to diagnose this. This is more relevant in cats because cats develop type 2 diabetes. And for type 2 diabetics, it's useful to know that you're pre-diabetic so that you can try to reverse it. 
Um, we don't have the specific criteria, but in certain at-risk patients, you can monitor the blood sugar, you can monitor the fructosamine, which remember is the average blood sugar. And sort of the classic example is an overweight cat that's on steroids and you're watching the blood sugar slowly increase as they come into the hospital, and that's concerning. And so what can you do? There are some measures you can take. You can try decreasing the steroid or changing medication. You can try switching to diet, different diets, which I'll get into later. And you can try to achieve weight loss and maybe you'll reverse some of these changes so that your cat will not need insulin. So treatment of diabetes, I thought I would just review the therapeutic goal that's outlined by the American Animal Hospital Association, a diabetic task force. So these are the leaders of the profession, very smart people. And they are defining a controlled diabetic as um, absence of clinical signs in hypoglycemia. And you'll notice that one thing is absent there, and that is what they recommend the blood sugar to be. They don't even mention normal blood sugar. They're just mentioning clinical signs and hypoglycemia. And that's important, something to remember, because in general, for diabetic cats and dogs, we don't regulate them to the same tight degree that you do in people. So my goals for glycemic control, um, I want the glucose generally to stay between 80 to 350, so that most of the day you're under that kidney threshold. Uh, and then you can see some statistics off on the right where about one in 200 cats is at risk of diabetes and one in 300 dogs. So it's, it's really quite a large proportion. Another potential therapeutic goal, this is specifically for cats, is the concept of insulin remission. So if you can give the pancreas a break, then maybe it can restore its function and start producing insulin on its own. But in general, insulin is the mainstay of therapy in dogs and cats for diabetes. Uh, we use insulin that's synthetic, so produced in um, a pharmaceutical company, and we're very lucky that insulin is well conserved across species because a lot of the times we're using human insulins in pets. And if the human insulin or the synthetic insulin was different in humans versus dogs and cats, then we could not do that. Most dogs and cats need insulin at least every 12 hours. It's really hard to get away with giving it less often. And an important thing to remember about insulin is once you give it, it doesn't immediately start working. It takes about one to two hours to take effect. And parameters that we're looking for to say if the insulin is successful. You want to see how long it lasts. Does it last a full 12 hours? Sometimes it only lasts eight to 10 hours. And there's a couple hours of the day where the um, insulin is out of the body and there's no insulin on board. We also want to see where is the insulin most effective, and we define that by something called a glucose nadir. So that's where the glucose drops the lowest because the insulin is at its highest concentration in the body, and that timing differs from patients. It's usually about 6 to 10 hours after receiving insulin. Uh, it's important to give insulin injections every 12 hours as much you can. Of course, there's a practical nature. It's not going to happen every single day for the rest of your pet's life, but it, as often as you can, this is helpful. And the reason for that is if you give the insulin... Um, you know, at 8 a.m. in the morning and 3 p.m. in the afternoon, you're going to have insulin doses that are overlapping. And then you could risk having a low blood sugar because there's too much insulin in the body. As well, at the end of the day, both insulin doses have worn off, so there's no insulin functioning at all and the blood sugar can skyrocket. So this is one of the few drugs where it really matters to give it every 12 hours. Most of the time we can get away with not being that precise. Um, this is a schematic just showing that insulin is well conserved across species. It doesn't actually have, uh, let's see, dogs here, but you can see feline cat insulin compared to human insulin, as well as comparing it to a couple of synthetic insulins um, that are pretty similar in structure. So one thing to mention is the pancreas, where insulin is produced, is a very sophisticated organ. It's constantly adjusting how much insulin it's producing. It's getting tons of feedback from when you eat, different hormones, other diseases in the body. 
And so it's a little unrealistic to think that two standard insulin doses a day are going to replicate a healthy pancreas that has all of this advanced function. And one way in people they're trying to overcome this is this smart technology or smart insulin. And there's a picture on the top right it's showing an insulin patch that's giving a constant infusion of insulin. And that is paired to a, a smart device, like a smartphone that is sensing the amount of uh, glucose that's present, the insulin dose is being adjusted accordingly, and this is all happening independent of the patient. So they're not looking at their glucose number and deciding glucose is 300, I give this, or the glucose is 40, I don't give insulin. It's just happening independently where these two devices are communicating with each other. And you're getting little minute to minute adjustments to try to keep the blood sugar controlled. And you know, maybe 10, 15 years, we'll have this in veterinary medicine, but right now this is just beyond our capabilities. So types of insulin that we have available, there's about eight listed here. Lantis or Glargine is my top choice in cats and Vetslin is my top choice in dogs. Um, though some dogs or cats will respond better to one insulin than another. So it's a little bit of trial and error to see what works. How do you give insulin? Um, at home, it's almost always given under the skin called subcutaneous. Uh, in the hospital, we can give it IV so it acts more quickly. We can give it into the muscle. Um, but when you're giving it at home, you give it sub-Q or under the skin. And you can either give it with an insulin syringe where you draw the dose um, each time right before giving it. Uh, and that's the picture on the far right. Or you can in use an insulin pen where you dial in the dose, one units, two units, et cetera. And the pen calibrates to give that specific amount of insulin. So depending on your lifestyle and your you know, personal um, preference, you can pick between these two. Uh, and then lastly, I'll mention insulin remission. So this is possible in cats with type 2 diabetes. And um, what happens is when you give the pancreas a break um, by giving synthetic insulin, then sometimes it can um, regain some of its function and start producing insulin on its own. Um, however, this can be almost more tricky than just a standard diabetic cat because sometimes the pancreas is working and producing insulin and sometimes it's not. And the amount of insulin the pancreas is producing can change. And so you don't know that day, is my, my cat's pancreas working? Is it not? How much insulin do I give? And so you really need to monitor these cats, cats very closely to avoid over or underdosing them with um, insulin. As well, even if you achieve an insulin remission in your cat, that may not be permanent. About one in four cats will need insulin later on. And I call it insulin remission. We call it insulin remission instead of diabetic remission because the um, underlying issues and the pathology is still there present in the pancreas. It's just that the pancreas has recovered enough function to not require insulin injections. Insulin remission is very rare or never seen in a dog, um, mostly because they develop type 1 diabetes. Um, so we talked about insulin as the mainstay of therapy for diabetic animals. Dietary management is also an com important component. Uh, you want to try to feed twice a day uh, and avoid snacking, which is very tough. Um, but when you snack, your blood sugar rises just a little bit kind of on and off throughout the day, and you may be eating when the insulin is not as potent. So better to give the meals twice a day right before the insulin is due. And that's a general rule of thumb um, where you feed first and then you give the insulin. And why is that? We talked about the insulin is not immediately going to kick in, but uh, feeding your pet and monitoring their appetite kind of gives you a general assessment of their well-being for the day. So if your cat or dog is not feeling well for whatever reason, maybe it has a little GI virus, maybe it's painful from arthritis, you know, something completely unrelated to diabetes, um, they may not eat as much and they subsequently may not need the full dose of insulin.
So that's why if you can feed first, give insulin. Now this is not going to work in cats or dogs that free feed. And so you kind of have to make an educated guess. You can give them a little treat right before the insulin, something they like just to see if they're interested. That's probably a good sign. Or you can look at the food dish over the past 24 hours and say, well, it's been you know nibbled on. They're probably okay to give the full dose. Um, cats and dogs have different dietary recommendations for diabetes. In cats, we call it the Catkins diet, if you haven't heard that before, instead of the Atkins diet. So we want low carb, high protein. And that's because a cat is a carnivore. So they, unlike dogs, really do not need carbohydrates or at least that many carbohydrates in their diet. If you want to feed a high protein food, this is best achieved with a canned food. If you have the same brand of pet food and you compare protein component or protein amounts in the canned versus the dry, the canned always has more protein and lower carbs compared to the dry version. And that's just due to how the kibble is processed. There are some prescription diets that I listed, which you can try, um, but in cats in particular, um, some of the you know, so-called junky cat foods like Fancy Feast and Friskies actually have quite a high protein component and they're just as good as a diabetic food. For dogs, the approach is a little bit different. You want complex carbs and high fiber. The complex carbs, these are things like whole grains, veggies, quinoa. They take a little more time to digest. So after the dog eats, it doesn't have this immediate um, post-eating glucose spike. The um, carbs are being digested and that glucose is being spread out over a couple of hours. The fiber makes the dogs feel full and it also can even out insulin or glucose absorption. You do have to be careful if it's a dog that's underweight because fiber um, is going to potentially cause weight loss. So there are similar prescription foods for dogs as well. Um, so we talked about insulin, we talked about diet, and then there's a third category of treatment, the oral hypoglycemic drugs. And before maybe, you know, three, six months ago, I would have said that they're almost never used in dogs and cats. Uh, why is that? Well, very few oral hypoglycemic drugs are effective in dogs because oral hypoglycemic drugs are used in type two diabetics. And remember that dogs are type one diabetics. So um, they really need insulin to uh, treat their diabetes. And then in cats, there was a lot of issues with drug toxicity because cats have a different metabolism in many ways than people. And as well, sometimes, you know, it's hard to give your cat multiple pills and have an extensive regimen. Cats can be tricky with how you medicate them. Um, however, in the past six months, a new drug or new class of drugs um, became available for cats only. And this is the sodium glucose transport inhibitors. This is a new oral hypoglycemic drug for cats. Uh, and how it works is it prevents sugar from being absorbed um, from the urine into the bloodstream. And we talked about how the sugar gets spilled into the urine. When there's excess sugar in the blood, it goes into the urine. And so this drug actually deliberately wants to keep the sugar in the urine and prevent the blood sugar from staying high. And it's a little counterintuitive, but it actually does not worsen the cat's urination, at least clinically that they've noticed. So it lowers blood sugar by increasing excretion of urine sugar. It's not an insulin, so it's not going to um, work on the cells to increase glucose entry into the cells. It's more um, just going to lower the sugar in the blood. It's once daily, which is a really nice option. It's a pill. Um, it's only licensed for cats at this time, though my colleague used it anecdotally in a dog, and it did seem to be effective, so that may be something to consider in the future. Uh, the two companies, Elanco and BI, that produced it, it's called Bexacat or Senvelgo. Um, it's FDA approved, which is pretty unusual for drugs and veterinary medicine. We use almost everything off label. Um, and they only recommend it in cats that have not yet received insulin, that are otherwise healthy, no pancreatitis, 
And there's some extra monitoring that the companies recommend um, to prevent complications with this medication, specifically um, what's called a euglycemic ketoacidosis, which um, can be a very serious diabetic complication, but because the blood sugar is normal as an effect of the drug, it's not as easy to recognize. Other oral hypoglycemic drugs to consider um, that we've had around for years, you know, 50 years. Uh, one is called glipizide. That's only for cats. Again, it helps the pancreas, um, stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin. Uh, another drug called a carbose which is for dogs, <clears throat> and this helps prevent absorption of glucose in the GI tract, so um, it doesn't cause the high blood sugar. Um, one of the side effects is diarrhea because the sugar has to go someplace, so if it's not getting absorbed, it's going to come out in the stool, but we rarely use these. Uh, and then something else that's kind of a trendy topic right now, the GLP-1 agonist. So this is Ozempic, Wegovy. Um, these are drugs that stimulate insulin secretion and they work through the GI tract. It's called the incretin effect. So you eat and that stimulates production of this GLP-1 hormone. The GLP-1 hormone stimulates insulin secretion um, and can help lower blood sugar. One of the other benefits of this medication, as I'm sure you've all heard of, is that it causes satiety so that you feel full and that induces weight loss. Um, however, it's quite expensive in people. I think Wigovi's, you know, maybe $1,000 a month for people. So it's probably cost prohibitive for most of our population. And there's little studied on it right now, mainly done in cats. There is a similar drug called exenatide that um, researchers have looked at weekly or even monthly injections, which would certainly be a great option if it was feasible. Um, one thing that's different for cats is because they're carnivores, the sh after eating sugar, it may not stimulate the same hormone release, the incretin effect, as it does in people. Um, okay, so that is treatment of diabetes, and now we'll move on to monitoring. Um, so clinical signs at home, <clears throat> we talked about increased urination and drinking, ravenous appetite. So are these signs getting better? This is often more important than any glucose or sugar testing that you can do um, in the clinics or at home. Uh, you want to look at the appetite, urination and drinking, and then something else to consider is looking at the weight, trying to weigh your cat or dog on a regular basis. And for cats, you might need to think about getting a little baby scale because for a cat, losing half a pound is significant um, or gaining half a pound is significant. And that is probably within the range of error, most human scales that just measure larger masses. <clears throat> Energy level is another factor to consider. So clinical signs are very important, but you can also monitor the sugar at home and can do that in a couple of ways. There are portable blood glucose meters. Uh, there's one specifically um, that was created for dogs and cats called the AlphaTrack. We prefer the veterinary ones because the human glucometers tend to be less accurate. Instead of pricking the finger, you can prick the ear or the paw pad to measure the blood sugar. But as you can imagine, depending on your pet and depending on you, this may not be um, you know, everyone's cup of tea. Um, if you are going to check the blood sugar at home using the portable glucometer, it's um, good time frames would be right before the insulin is due to see how high does the sugar get as my insulin is wearing off. At the glucose nadir, which again is when the insulin is at its peak effect and the blood sugar is going to be the lowest. So that's a good way to screen for low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. And then sometimes um, your vet may ask you to do a glucose curve where you measure the blood sugar every two to three hours over one day to see what's happening in the body over a 12 hour period. Urine dipsticks is another. Um, monitoring modality. This is where you can measure glucose and ketones in the urine. Um, it's not as accurate and to measure the urine sugar as it is the blood sugar. So you remember the kidney threshold. So 
sugar is only going to show up in the urine if it exceeds this kidney threshold. So the sugar could be 250 in a cat, but the urine um, sugar is negative. And you might initially be alarmed and say, oh, I think the blood sugar is too low. But actually, it's if anything, it's still high at 250. And same in dogs. Um, as well, you know, depending on when the animal peed, um, the urine may be pooled in the bladder. And so what you're testing for may be what happened three hours ago. There may be a delay in what the um, urine sugar is compared to what the blood sugar is doing. The nice thing about urine dipsticks, it's non-invasive. You don't have to poke or prod your pet. Um, you can also measure ketones very easily. Um, it's probably a lot easier to do this in a dog versus a cat. So if your cat is not urinating excessively, it's a matter of, you know, following them into the litter box to get a urine sample. And that is just not practical for every cat. Uh, <clears throat> so when you buy urine dipsticks, if you do that, you want to make sure they measure both glucose and ketones, especially if <clears throat> the cat is on the new oral hypoglycemic drugs. Ketones are very important. So how do you monitor the urine in cats? And this is not just for diabetes. If you ever need to get a urine sample from your cat, well, disclaimer, it is not easy, but here are some tips that you can try. You can use non-absorbable litter. There is a commercially available brand called Nozorb. You can put popcorn kernels in the litter. They may or may not fall for it. Um, you can cover the liver with saran wrap and they can, you know, kind of do their kneading and their um, kicking up with the litter, but maybe it'll be one little drop of urine left on the saran wrap that you can um, apply to your dipstick. There used to be this great product called Glucotest by Purina, this little square tablet that you would just throw in the urine and it would change color if sugar was present. And so it was a really easy way if you have a single cat or a single cat litter box to say whether or not there's um, sugar in the urine. Um, and then finally, you'll see this picture in the middle is this smart litter box where there is non-absorbable litter of like safflower seeds or something similar where the urine just drains to the bottom. There's a little dish that you pull out, the urine collects there, and then you can easily do a urine dipstick. So if your cat will, uh, will use that box. And then finally, there's the interstitial glucose sensor. The one that we use is called the Freestyle Libra, the FSL. And we have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this device. And I'm sure many of our pet owners feel the same. So it's a small needle is inserted under the skin and that needle stays there. And then there's this white disc that's perpendicular to the needle that gets glued onto the skin using skin glue. And the needle is sensing the interstitial interstitial glucose was essentially the glucose under the skin. And it's transmitting that number to a um, device, whether it's a, a specific reader or your smartphone. And it's telling you what that sugar is constantly. So 24 hours a day, you're getting an interstitial sugar reading. And it's very nice because it gives you a whole bunch more data, you know, 100 times more data than doing a blood glucose curve. Um, however, there are a number of pitfalls to this device. One is that it is notoriously less accurate when the blood sugar falls. Um, and we know that. And you know, when you see a low sugar reading for the interstitial sensor, you take it with a grain of salt. So it might actually be higher in the blood. Um, it's also easy to get kind of... Um, overly attached to the numbers and obsess over the numbers and say, well, the glucose is still too high. I want to fine tune and maybe over-regulate the diabetics. And I'll just remind you of this statement from the leaders of the profession, the definition of a controlled diabetic is the absence of clinical signs and hypoglycemia. It's not recommending a certain glucose range. Um, as well, the sensor is supposed to last for 14 days. I would say that is the exception, not the rule, unfortunately, where it often becomes prematurely inactivated in cats and dogs. And whether that's because the needle gets bent or they're rolling around and the sensor dislodges, 
um, or it just stops working because the in, the un, sub Q of the dog is different from the person. You know, many times people contact me that the sensor is inactivated in five days, six days, you know, maybe 10 days if you're lucky. Cats um, will often just rip it off before the sensor even starts working. So it can be a whole different ball game with them. Um, the nice thing about this sensor is that it can be placed at home if you are experienced with it. So you don't have to constantly bring your pet into the clinic to get tested. Um, those are at home devices. In the hospital, we can do a couple things as well for monitoring. We can do fructosamines. I like to do that whenever I have a diabetic coming in for a recheck. And um, again, the fructosamine is giving me the average blood sugar over about two weeks. Um, you can do a single glucose reading at the time of the visit. I try to schedule my diabetics so they come in at the glucose nadir when the insulin is most effective. So I'll have the best chance of catching hypoglycemia or a low blood sugar. And I would say in general, glucose curves are falling out of favor, um, at least in the hospital. Um, it's really not a good, it's really quite an artificial atmosphere for the animal. You know, they're in a cage, so they're not moving around. They're eating more or less than normal. They don't have regular access to the bathroom. There's just a lot of differences in the hospital when they're in a cage versus at home. And stress in particular is a big component in cats. And there have been studies looking at glucose curves performed on consecutive days. So do a glucose curve on a Monday, you do it on a Tuesday, and maybe based on Monday's results, you would increase the insulin. Based on Tuesday's results, you would keep the insulin the same or decrease it. So there's such wide variability that it's really hard to know how to um, respond to it. Uh, next topic is complications of diabetes. So I'll just discuss the most serious ones. Um, hypoglycemia, that's where the blood sugar is too low and most likely there has been too much insulin given. So there are some technical factors where this can happen. Um, you know, the insulin that you're giving in a small dog or a cat is just a minuscule, tiny amount. You may not even believe that you're giving anything but air. And so instead of giving the one unit that was prescribed, you've given 10 units. That's a 10 time overdose. Or maybe mom and dad both accidentally gave the insulin one night. Um, that's one scenario. That's more of technical factors. Um, and then there is physiologic factors where this is a, you know, a cat has gone into an insulin remission. So suddenly the pancreas has produced its own insulin and that cat didn't need the insulin that you gave it. That's another classic scenario we'll see through the ER. So clinical signs can range quite a bit. There can be a little bit of weakness or maybe they're just sleepy to seizures to really a life-threatening crisis. Cats in general are more resistant to hypoglycemia than dogs. Um, they usually don't show signs until their blood sugar drops quite low, maybe 40 to 50. Um, as well, cats are able to synthesize sugar from amino acids so they can compensate a little better if their blood sugar does drop too low. Uh, another major serious complication is diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. And this is the flip side where you have an insufficient insulin dose. Um, and sometimes this can happen in a diabetic animal that hasn't been treated for a while or has been treated at too low of a dose. A lot of times it develops because another disease has developed, particularly pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. So um, with diabetes, you have um, insufficient insulin by the pancreas. So the whole organ can dysfunction. But really any and every disease, um, additional disease can cause DKA in cats and dogs. And the animals will feel extremely sick when they are, have ketoacidosis. So this is when the body starts breaking down fat for energy because although there's a lot of sugar in the bloodstream, it's not making its way into the organs. 
So the fat is broken down, it's converted into ketones. Ketones are acidic, so they'll lower the blood pH, and that is what makes the pet feel very sick. And it almost always requires hospitalization for pretty intensive support, IV insulin, IV fluids, and usually takes a little under a week to resolve. Um, Long-term complications, you know, we, we rarely see the complications that plague people such as kidney dysfunction or issues with perfusion where you need an amputation of, you know, your foot or something like that. And this may be because dogs and cats just don't live long enough to develop those complications. You know, a lot of times in cats in particular, it's a disease in older cats. So if they're 12 years old and, you know, they live another five, maybe six years at most um, compared to a person who's going to be diabetic for decades. Um, there's also different um, pathologies. So cats and dogs develop different complications. We talked about diabetic cataracts. Um, that's most common in dogs. We talked about the plantigrade stance where cats are walking on their heels instead of on their toes. These are the complications that we tend to see. And then finally, another complication, so to speak, is when the diabetes is just not controlled. Uh, and there's lots of different reasons for that. The first one to always troubleshoot is the technical aspect. So is your client, um, are you drawing up the correct dose? Are you giving the insulin properly under the skin? Are you rotating where you give the insulin so that one area of skin doesn't become hardened and thickened where the insulin can't get absorbed? Is the insulin expired? You know, all sorts of features that are not a matter of the pathology in the dog and cat, it's just that the insulin is not being given appropriately. Um, as well, we see um, concurrent or an additional disease that causes insulin resistance. Cushing's disease is classic. It's very hard to regulate diabetic dogs when they have Cushing's disease. And endocrine or hormonal diseases tend to go together. So if a dog has one, it may develop another. UTIs um, is a common culprit. Diabetic animals are predisposed to UTIs because of the sugar in their urine. And then one thing that you may not consider is really severe inflammation and tartar on the teeth is a source of ongoing inflammation in the body, and that can lead to insulin resistance. <clears throat> Um, other factors that can cause uncontrolled diabetes, certain drugs like steroids can um, prevent the efficacy of the insulin. And then finally, last thing to discuss is prognosis. So even though you know, diabetes is pretty intimidating when you are for, your pet is first diagnosed with it, it's a lot of at-home care that you have to get comfortable with. <coughs> excuse me, a lot of monitoring both at home and coming into the vet, talking with your vet, troubleshooting things. But the prognosis is good. Um, the future is bright. Many diabetic pets can live long, healthy lives with no or happy lives with no issues. The average median survival time after diagnosis is about two to four years. But remember, um, a lot of those patients are older at diagnosis, and so they may just be reaching the end of their natural lifespan. You should expect if you have a long-term diabetic, at some point you will develop a complication, whether the insulin is too high or too low, or at the very least you're going to need to tweak your insulin dose over the years. Um, you can try to prevent diabetic complications by monitoring your dog or cat at home with the devices that I mentioned. Um, you can't expect the diabetes to be regulated if you only check the blood sugar twice a year when the dog or cat comes into the hospital. Um, but in general, diabetic pets can, can really do quite well. And that is it. Thank you so much. This was very comprehensive and you explained everything so well and so clearly. We have a few questions which we will get to. Um, see, we had a question about, is it a problem if your pet doesn't eat enough to warrant giving the insulin? Yes, that's definitely an issue that comes up a lot. And whether the decrease in appetite is related to the diabetes or not, sometimes it's hard to decide how much insulin should I give. 
the general rule of thumb is if your pet skips a meal, you should give a half dose of insulin. If they skip two meals in a row, you may want to contact your vet and bring them in to see what's going on. Because even if it's unrelated to diabetes, if they're not eating, you need, it's hard to know how much insulin to give. Okay. This is kind of related. You, you mentioned the symptoms if given too much insulin, but what do you do at the point if given too much? Do you bring them in or? Yeah. yeah. So, so if you realize it, even if the dog or cat is not symptomatic, say you've given them a double dose, then I think it would be a good idea to bring them into the clinic to see what the blood sugar is and see if they need to be hospitalized for IV synthetic sugar overnight. If they, um, if they seem okay, you immediately just give them something to eat because that will help bring up the blood sugar. And in really critical situations where you can't get into the vet right away or it's a bit of a drive, then you can give a call like caro syrup or just sort of some sort of liquid sugar that gets absorbed along the gum so they don't have to swallow to um, absorb the sugar. Uh, and that can help reverse some of the changes. Okay. Um, with my di diabetic cats years ago, I got a blood sample for a glucose testing from their ear. How do you get a sample from a dog? Same way. Yeah, you can do it way. from the ear as well, or sometimes the paw pad, just wherever you have a little superficial vein that you can access. Okay. Um, we had a question about, I guess, the glue, if you, if there's any veterinary glue to use to keep the, you know, the monitor on <laughs> oh yes okay. yes there's there's sticky there's a sticky adhesive on the sensor itself and then we usually also apply a surgical glue so it's not you know obviously like your Elmer's glue it's a surgical mm -hmm. glue that's safe for the skin that attaches the sensor to the skin sometimes it's hard knowing exactly how much to add if you add too much it can actually be hard to get the sensor off and it can cause a little skin irritation but oftentimes the sensors have a bit of glue applied as well Okay, great. You'd be surprised um, cats can still rip those little things oh, yeah. off though. They're very clever. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, let's see. We does diabetes cause dementia? Um, probably not directly. Mm -hmm. It's possible if the blood sugar is consistently low. You know, the sugar is extremely important to the brain to function. So if the blood sugar is running low, you may see some um, neurological effects, but Otherwise, it shouldn't have any direct impact. Okay, great. Um, why are some dogs like schnauzers, I think samoyeds you mentioned, more prone to diabetes? Why is it? Yeah. It's probably in their genetics. Um, I don't think the specific genes have been worked out. Schnauzers in general are prone to a lot of hormone disorders, diabetes, Cushing's, high lipids. Uh, we don't know exactly why, but there is most likely a genetic predisposition. Okay, great. Um, do you recommend any general diets to prevent diabetes for dogs or things like intermittent fasting? I don't. I think in dogs in particular, it's a type one diabetes. It's sort of like little kids when they develop diabetes, there's probably not much you can do. You could try the diabetic foods, which have complex carbs and high fibers, but I don't think fasting would help. For okay. cats, you know, they can be pre-diabetic, so you can try to prevent it by inducing weight loss and, and switching to a high protein diet. Okay, great. Um, why do cats go in and out of remission? Um, it's due to the, the nature of their type 2 diabetes. So for type 2 diabetes, the at a cer certain point, the pancreas is still producing insulin. It's just that the insulin is not working as well on a cellular level. Um, eventually the pancreas gets exhausted and stops producing insulin, but once it gets a little rest, it will start producing it again. And so um, they can go in and out of remission depending on how functional their pancreas is. Okay, and that can, that can also depend on what other diseases are present um, in the body that are causing insulin resistance. Okay, great. Um, we had a question, what other diseases mimic or the symptoms of the signs of diabetes? Probably the most common one in dogs is Cushing's disease, where they drink and urinate a lot and they're ravenous. So dogs with Cushing's disease don't tend to lose weight. 
And then there are many diseases that can cause increased drinking and urination, kidney disease, thyroid disease, um, infections, um, liver disease. So if that's the primary issue, usually it's pretty easy to decide right away whether or not the pet has diabetes mellitus. Uh, and then you kind of run through your checklist to see what else it could be. Great. Um, do you have time to comment on insul insulinoma? I had a dog that had been presumed to have it, but when they excised part of the pancreas, no tumors were found. Is that Insulinoma is when um, it's the opposite problem of diabetes. It's a tumor in the pancreas that's overproducing insulin. Um, and um, it's usually only seen in dogs. I don't know if it's been reported in cats. And it's notoriously difficult to diagnose and find the source of the tumor. It can be extremely small in the pancreas. So even if you're at surgery, a surgeon can feel the pancreas and there's no obvious external abnormalities that will pinpoint where the tumor is. Okay, great. Um, if the insulin is given, I am in trim muscularly or IV, how long is the onset to it working? How, how different is that? If you give the insulin, there's um, a certain type of insulin that can be given IV and intramuscularly. It's called regular insulin. Um, if you give it IV, it works right away and you have to give it as an infusion to keep it active in the body. If you give it in the muscle, it lasts about four to six hours. Okay, great. Um, Let's see. As a last resort for a difficult cat, can any of the oral meds be crushed and added to food? Um, there's only really the, the Bexacat or the sodium glucose transport inhibitors that we've just started using. I don't know if they can be crushed, if that will affect their efficacy. Probably should be fine. I don't know if they can be compounded as a liquid. One of them, the Senvelgo, actually is a liquid, so that could be another option. But otherwise, the glipizide, that's the other oral hypoglycemic used in cats. Um, I, I have used that. I, I've crushed it before. It's just not that effective in general for diabetes in cats. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um... Everyone's saying what a great presentation, very, oh, very you. thorough. Yeah, it was really thank you. wonderful. So um, let me see. I think this is, you know, we've covered most of them. Um, let's see, do, do pets get diabetic neuropathy or myopathy? They do. Cats get, that's what we call our plantigrade neuropathy in cats. Rarely in dogs, they'll develop that. It's mainly concentrated in the back legs where they get that weakness where they, you know, instead of walking upright, they walk flat footed. Sometimes it can happen in the front legs, um, but that's generally what we see. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Eppelman. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, just a reminder. Yeah, just a reminder to everyone, we will send this out tomorrow, send a link so you can watch it again. Um, and I just want to thank Maria Moiser for helping out tonight. Um, don't worry, Kimberly Young will be back next time. Um, but really, this was wonderful, Dr. Appleman. I know how busy the service is and you are, and we greatly appreciate your time and, and going over this with us. Um, okay, everyone, thank you all so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night.